Hey fam, welcome to the Free Trail Podcast. Of course, I am your host, Dylan Bowman, one of the founders of Free Trail. A couple of things to get to before today's show. Please, if you're watching here on YouTube, smash the subscribe button if you don't mind. We're gonna slowly try and build this channel over time. So hit the subscribe button so you can be informed each and every time we drop a new video here. Also, please consider joining Free Trail Pro. There's a link in the description of today's YouTube podcast episode. Join the community, it's only $100 a year. Connect with an amazing group of diverse runners from around the world who you can connect with, learn from, and follow along as we all take part in this incredible sport. Finally, we have a lot of great sponsors on our show. The show would not exist without the sponsors. Please do take the time to go to the show notes, click through, find the discount codes, and next time you're in the market, for any of the great trail running products, please do consider visiting and supporting the sponsors who support us. Shannon O'Grady, welcome back to the Free Trail Podcast. So good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I feel like maybe you need like an Irish brogue. You need to work on your Irish brogue for for my introductions. It almost sounded like you were going to jump into one, but... (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm not going to embarrass myself trying to do that here. (laughs) But uh, your podcast that we did November of 2022 is one of the most popular we've ever done here on the podcast. It's funny, we've even had multiple people like comment on the YouTube in the last couple of weeks. So it's getting fed back into people's algorithms now. And you and I speak rather frequently just with our work that we do together in partnership between Free Trail and Gnarly. And it's as good a time as ever to have you back on the program to dispense your amazing nutrition wisdom to the trail running world. So thank you so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, I every time you say that, it like I, I'm grateful to be on the podcast. I'm super happy that people, hopefully they're listening because they found it helpful and not because they were, are like, what is she saying? But um, I love talking about nutrition. It, I love talking to you. So, it, you know, I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Yeah. Okay. So since you've been on the show, I've started introducing a new traditional opening question. So to stay consistent with all of our guests, I have to pose it to you here. And that is Shannon, what makes you, you reintroduce yourself to the free trail audience? What are your unique character traits? How do they show up in your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a nutrition nerd at heart. I mean, I love sport. I love nutrition. I love the intersection of those two things. Um, but I think like, as far as strengths, I'm a pretty driven and determined person. Um, I used to have the trio of words, um, decide, commit, succeed under my signature and my name. Um, because to me, that really speaks to like the intention with which you um, devote to something. And I always try if I'm if I'm going to show up for something, I try to try to show up like in my full self. So it, for me, that's a really good way to to summarize that. Decide, commit, succeed. I love it. In that spirit, Shannon, I think this is at least one of the first podcasts you've done where we can talk about the new job that you have. You are stepping up into the CEO role after many years operating as the chief operating officer and the chief product officer at Gnarly Nutrition. You are now the big boss. So tell us about your feelings stepping into this new role. How does it feel and how does it change your day to day? Terrifying. (laughs) I mean, um, I'm always up for a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of skill sets I need to gain, um, but I'm also really excited. I mean, I've always had a vision for what I'd love Gnarly to be. And and we've started kind of addressing um, some of those changes and, and the evolution of the brand over the last couple of years. But I'm I'm really excited to dive in. And um, I think the any confidence that I have really comes from the team that we have at Gnarly and and um, the team that we're adding to. And I've always believed like no one person can be good at all the things you know you need to be good at, especially when it comes to running a business. And so hiring experts um, and then trusting those experts to do their job, I think is critical. So um, I'm super psyched for the year. I'm super psyched for some things we've got brewing. Um, And I I think 2024 is going to be pretty amazing for the brand. If you don't mind entertaining me talking about this a little bit longer, I don't know. 
like, see, I was thinking this morning about female CEOs in the outdoor industry. And the only person that I could come up with off the top of my head, granted, I'm not an expert on this subject, but the new president of the North Face is a female leader of a huge company. Gnarly's obviously much smaller than the North Face, but there aren't a lot of female CEOs in the outdoor industry. Is there any network that you've been able to take advantage of or anything about just being a female leader in the industry that you think the listeners would like to hear? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't know very many either. Um, And that might be because I just have had my head down for the last, you know, few years trying to make gnarly gnarly and um and working at it but it's definitely something that I'm looking at building and and when uh you know transitioning to CEO was kind of first put in front of me um gender aside I reached out to everybody I knew not necessarily in a CEO position but folks that um you know headed up marketing folks that were more involved with sales all the different arms of a business just to get their feedback on what they'd like to see in executives they work with and what they thought made teams um, powerful, capable, and effective. Um, and that that has been great. And I'll continue doing that like no matter you know what the position is or 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 who it is I'm talking to. I'm I'm always open to learning new things. In the subject of leadership, obviously last time you were on the show, you're a PhD, you're a science oriented person, you're an academic at heart. Does the leadership and the business operations part come naturally to you or is this something <laughs> where you're going to have to grow? You're really good at these questions, Dylan. Uh, no. Um, I mean, oftentimes, even in my previous role, I was like, man, could have used all those years in graduate school getting an MBA. <laughs> um and and while I still love like talking about the nutrition stuff, I love talking to athletes. I love talking to customers. Um, you know, more of my day to day has become the business side of things. Um, so I'm I've got a lot a lot to learn in that space. But I think ultimately, um, leading the company can come from how you relate to others. And um, you know, I've been working on that for the last few years and and I think approaching relationships with honesty and transparency and really focusing on clear communication and making sure you listen to people and where they're coming from um, and their perspective is is paramount. And so I'm going to keep doing that. I think the nutrition piece is important for directing the brand in the right direction. So I'm going to keep doing that and I'm hoping all the other stuff catches up. Yeah, well, I can speak from experience that you are a highly capable and honest leader. And I think this is going to be a great next chapter for you and for Gnarly as a brand. And we will miss Eli, the Narzar, as we called him. Yeah. But welcome, Shannon O'Grady, to the new CEO, Gnarly Nutrition. All right. Again, before we get to the substance, let's plug the podcast. I was the first guest, the Narstool. Not only are you the CEO, not only are you a PhD, but now you're a world famous podcaster. Tell the people. <laughs> world, world famous, air yeah. quotes. Well, tell, tell everybody, because it's a, it's a cool show. It's a different type of format. You guys have fun with it, but it's also really informative. So just fill the people in on, on the Narstool podcast and you know how it's been going for you in these early stages. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, um, I don't know how many, we're under 20 episodes in. So definitely early stages. We've had some amazing gift, guests. We kicked it off with you, which was such a good episode. Um, and really, we are talking to people from all walks of life. So clearly, you know, athletes, but also um We've talked to an amazing chef. We've talked to musicians. We've talked to um, athletes of all different types, everything from like MMA to obviously ultra running to pro mountain biking to snowboarders um, to skateboarders. And we're just trying to really dig in and hear people's stories, hear how they've overcome challenges, talk a little bit about nutrition and training and just, you know, really bring back that the conversation that I think in today's day and age gets lost a little bit. And that's one thing that I've really appreciated is um, that art of conversation and figuring out how to really tap into that. Um, and, and the episodes are great. I mean, I think we're laughing most of the time, but there are definitely interviews that we've done where like, 
I have cried, you know, I'm shedding a tear because some of the moments are so personal. Um, it's been amazing. I, I actually really love it. Podcasting is the best. And your co-host, John Perry, shout out to Perry, who is the, he's in charge of marketing for Gnarly mm -hmm. and uh, was the uh, creator of the Friday ad that we did for the <laughs> orange drink. So everybody's got to tune into the NAR still. Maybe we'll come back and talk about some of that creative marketing stuff here later in the conversation. But let's go into the nutrition talk. Enough of this preamble. The people want to learn from you, <laughs> Shannon. Uh, the place that I wanted to start with you is sort of back at the 101 level where we ended our last conversation. That is just with the difference between macro and micronutrients. Get as basic as you can. What is a macronutrient? What is a micronutrient? How should active people think about both? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we can look at the prefix of those words and, and, and get a pretty good understanding. So macro means big, micro means small. Uh, macronutrients are anything we need in our diets and larger um, amounts and they're typically measured in grams. So carbohydrates, proteins, um, fats, micronutrients are things that we need in our diet in smaller amounts. Um, so typically measured in milligrams and micrograms and um, vitamins and minerals are great examples of that. And generally, this isn't true like across the board, but generally macronutrients are used to create energy in our body. So we turn them into energy. You know, obviously, we don't uh, use protein as much as we do carbs or fats for energy, but, you know, in a pinch, our body will break down uh, muscle to, to meet energetic demands um, and your body can use amino acids, you know, as energy, whereas micronutrients are things more that support uh, metabolism. So a little bit different, some differences, both in terms of the amounts we take in, but then also how they're used in our, in our bodies. So give some examples of micronutrients. Sure. Um, vitamin D, vitamin K, you know, vitamin B, um, iron, zinc, copper. Those are all micronutrients. Okay. And then the macros are carbs, protein, fats. Yep. And then, I mean, you can go into like, there, there are, uh, you know, subclasses of those like, you know, polyunsaturated fats versus saturated, you know, you can, you can okay. definitely dig in on each of those, but like in the most general sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. And there's a lot of conversation about like the balance of macros, both in, well, mostly in like a lifestyle application before we move off this subject, is there anything you want to add to that? Like, especially how athletes and trail runners should think about that balance of macros and their daily nutrition habits. Yeah, I mean, I think um, as hopefully most of your runners know, like for endurance athletes, carbohydrates are are critical. Um, I think sometimes um, in sport we can get um, overtaken by the importance of one versus the other. Like some endurance athletes, I would say maybe under eat protein a little bit, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about you know what protein intake uh, should look like, and then you know maybe more in strength based sports, they might think that carbohydrates aren't as necessary. Um, and so I really believe in a more balanced diet. Um, that got, you know, a bad rap in the nineties. I was, I was definitely a product of that generation when, you know, snack wells were around and you were counting all of your, you know, the fat grams that you took in and fat is incredibly important for health. Um, and, you know, when it comes to that, I feel like often people um, still demonize it or go the opposite way and and maybe consume too much. So even when it comes to fat, I, fe I feel like balance is important. And if you're choosing whole foods that have, um, you know, good amounts of all three of those, um, we're looking for polyunsaturated fats or the kind of fats you would find in things like salmon and avocado, you know, then you're doing yourself a favor and you're, you're getting high quality nutrient dense foods on a regular basis. And that's a great way to, to kind of go about things. All right. We're off to a good start here, Shannon. <laughs> Metabolism. I don't really know what the word means. So maybe I'll give you my interpretation of what it means. And you can tell me how close or far I am from the actual truth. When we eat things, there's a process that takes place that either creates energy or some other outcome. And that process is more or less our metabolism. Is that a correct association or a correct description of what metabolism is? Yeah, Debo, listen to you. I mean, I think that's pretty good. Um, 
that is one uh, definition of a type of metabolic reaction. So we can, you know, think of uh, metabolism in the body as reactions that are necessary for like health, even for life. Um, and so those can be both reactions that create things and reactions that break things down. So um, typically for, you know, reactions where we're creating things, um, we refer to those as anabolic. So um, it could be like turning protein that we consume and the, the inherent amino acids in that protein into muscle. Um, but then we could also look at metabolic reactions as catabolic, where you're breaking things down. That could be, you know, we just talked about when you don't have enough calories and your body starts to break down muscle in order to meet those, uh, that energetic deficit. So both of those are metabolic reactions. They're just two different types. So is there ways that, again, thinking from the listener's perspective here, that people can improve that metabolic process in themselves? Uh, yeah, you know, that it's it, that's, I'm going to say it's a loaded question because people are always, I feel like internet um, nutritionists, I'll just <laughs> say that, are always talking about like improving your metabolism or the impact of dieting on your metabolism. Um, so like in a broad stroke, yes, maybe um, as you, an example would be like the whole idea behind, you know, lower intensity training is to um, increase the, uh, your ability to burn fat as a fuel when you're at lower intensities. Um, and that is both wrapped up in how your body uses fat as a fuel. And that would be a metabolic adaptation. But it's also wrapped into the, into the cardiovascular fitness that you build as a consequence of spending more time um, training at low intensity heart rate. So um, I think it's more um, there's more detail that often gets left out, and people often will like to say that either a certain supplement or a certain diet or a certain way of eating can improve your metabolism. And I feel like that's a really loaded statement. See, this is why we have you on the show here, Shannon. This is amazing. <laughs> All right, the next thing I want to talk about is nutrition timing. And the reason this came to my mind is something I wanted to talk to you about is that I've seen a lot about like carbohydrate periodization, especially in the endurance sport scene. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's become more of a conversation, maybe fewer carbs on recovery days, increasing proteins and fats on those recovery days, and then instituting more carbs on days where you're more active. So how should people think about nutrient timing and especially this carbohydrate periodization subject? Yeah. So, um, I love the term nutrient timing because I think it really gets at the heart of why this is useful. Um, so you can look at nutrient timing, both in terms of like how you might, um, plan out your nutrition around a particular workout in a single day. And then you can also look at that nutrition, nutrient timing across a few days or a week with how your training might fluctuate from one day to, or, to another. And essentially, you know, at its most base level, what we're trying to do is make sure that our body has what it needs um, in order to do what we're asking of it, right? So um, that could be anything from, you know, making sure we have the appropriate carbohydrates on board that our glycogen stores in our muscle and our liver are full before we're starting out on a longer training run. Um, it could be making sure that um, we're eating simple carbohydrates right before a workout that's going to be higher intensity so that our blood glucose levels are topped off and we can do our best at, you know, at that higher level of exertion. Um, it could look like making sure we're timing protein appropriately after a workout to get the most of our recovery. So like at its, sim you know, simplest uh, basic definition, we're just making sure that we're optimizing our nutrition. And that involves a timing component relative to the type of training we're doing and then when we're doing it during the day. Um, across, like when we're looking specifically at carbohydrate periodization, like you mentioned, maybe taking in fewer carbohydrates, maybe higher protein and fat on rest and recovery days, that also gets back to that idea, right? So potentially if you're training less, 
um, you're losing using fewer carbohydrate stores and you just don't need to fuel with as many carbohydrates in that day as you did the previous day. The one thing I would say about that is if you had a really big day or you did a two a day or you had back to back long runs over the weekend, you want to make sure your body has what it needs to recover. So potentially cutting carbohydrates too low would do yourself a disservice. But at the same time, making sure you have enough protein and getting in that fat. So we are our bodies actually adapting to using fat as a fuel at, at rest. And um, that also makes sense. You just want to make sure you weigh that recovery piece at the same time as you're looking at um, what your body may be using on a rest day or not using. So it's not all about necessarily what you're consuming, but there's also a consideration of when you're consuming. A hundred percent. And that's, that's where, you know, like on longer runs, a lot of people do them first thing in the morning and may not have had the ability to have a meal two to three hours beforehand. They just have come off an overnight fast. Their glycogen stores are going to be lower. So making sure that they get some kind of simple carbohydrate in their body, like 30 to 60 minutes beforehand, and then fuel appropriately during the run is going to be critical, particularly if maybe it's at a higher intensity. Following up with some carbs and hydration and protein is going to be key to recovery, especially if you're going to turn around and do another long run the next day. So it's really timing the nutrients that you're taking in around your training and even subsequently for the rest of the day to maybe make up for a caloric deficit that you um, created during that long run so that tomorrow when you go to do your training, you're you're set to go and you feel good and your body's ready to perform. Okay, great. So while we're on the subject of day-to-day nutrition, I also want to ask you about day-to-day hydration. Last time you were on the show, we talked for a while about electrolytes. I sort of operate from the assumption that most people and especially most athletes underhydrate. How do you think about your own personal hydration? Like how much water, when are you using electrolytes? And I guess for now, just focus on that lifestyle element rather than the performance element. Yeah, um, this is a great question. I think we all probably at one time or another during our lives heard like the eight glasses of water a day, you know, as a recommendation. And there's not a ton of scientific basis to that. Um, I think what I've read most recently that I put the most stock in, in terms of determining how much water you, you need to take in daily is more of a retrospective look at what you did the day before. And it's called the what model, what W U T. Um, and that stands for um, weight urine and thirst. So the weight piece um, is is basically first thing in the morning, getting up and weighing yourself. And if there's greater a, a greater fluctuation in your weight than 1%, um, you should take like a little mental note, like if your weight was t- down 2% from what it normally is, then um, that is one potential a uh, sign of of not consuming enough water the previous day. Urine relates to urine color, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. The darker your urine color, the more likely you are to be dehydrated. The lighter your urine color, the likely more likely you are to be hydrated. The one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that when that scale was created, um, the the research that went into it really only supported using urine color first thing in the morning. So a lot you'll hear a lot of people talking about that throughout the course of the day. But in reality, it's really only a good sign of how hydrated you are first thing in the morning oh. after you haven't just consumed water. So um, that goes also into the what model. So same kind of thing, same principles, but just um, better used as a, as a first thing in the morning measure of hydration status. And then the last one is super simple. It's whether or not you're thirsty. And so the, what model basically states, like, if you, if you, there's no like perfect measurement of hydration or dehydration that we can do at home, 
But by looking at these three factors, um, we can get an idea of whether we did enough the previous day to be in a hydrated state. So if you've lost over 1% of your body weight when you weigh yourself first thing in the morning, and um, or I'd say the fluctuation is greater than 1%, and your urine color is dark, it's a good sign that you probably didn't drink enough water yesterday. If on top of that, you're also thirsty, you definitely didn't drink enough water yesterday. And so it goes any two, like maybe your thirst, maybe your weight's fine, but maybe you're thirsty and your urine color's dark, same kind of thing. Um, so just keeping stock and it could be something, I know a lot of people keep training logs, um, might measure their heart rate first thing in the morning. Um, this could be something that you add to that. So like, what is your weight? Um, is the difference between what it was yesterday greater than 1%? Is your urine color too dark? Were you thirsty? And just paying attention then if those things are showing you you're dehydrated, maybe start paying attention to how much water you drank the previous day and start slowly upping that. So good. So then with electrolytes from a lifestyle application perspective, how do you approach it? I'm sure it fluctuates based on the time of the year and how active you are, but like, are you having a gnarly hydrate before like at the beginning of a day sometimes or how do you make sure that your electrolytes are I, mean, <laughs> I have it right now um but it's for me it's mainly for taste like i think you and i are the same and that we add a fair amount of salt to our food and so i'm not um i'm not really drinking uh salt in my water per se because i i need electrolytes having some salt in your water and a little bit of sugar in your water actually helps the water pass into your body even better. So water passively travels along a concentration gradient from our gut into our body. It can also be actively pushed via the sodium glucose pump. So having some sodium, having a little bit of sugar helps not only passively push water, but also actively push water. Um, and so when you do drink water, if you're drinking it with a meal, you're benefiting from the sodium and glucose that are naturally in what you're eating. So maybe not something to worry about. But if you're drinking water as a standalone, adding something like a gnarly hydrate or um, even a little maple syrup and, and uh, salt can actually help the water better hydrate you than just drinking water alone. Maybe we should talk about the salt component now too, while we're on this lifestyle element. I have told you that I'm sure. a heavy salter. And it sounds like you maybe are also. So what are the considerations there? Because, you know, you always hear too much sodium is a bad thing. Obviously, it's different for athletes, but, you know, I'm getting older now. I want to make sure I'm set myself up for longevity. So is it bad that I use a lot of salt? And how should people think about adding salt to their meals uh, in lifestyle application? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, athletes use more salt because we sweat more. And so it is okay for us to add slightly more salt um, to our foods to make up for that. Um, we have to watch salt intake, um, the links to high blood pressure and cardiovascular issues are pretty established. And sodium intake is one of um, the things I think that um, is a major determinant of it in terms of risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So um, that being said, I, I think we also need to be aware of maybe how much we're adding on a, a daily basis. As far as recommendations, I don't really have like a clear recommendation for that. I will say that the I think the RDA is like 2300 or 2500 milligrams, um, which as a population, the U.S. far exceeds on a regular basis um, because of the amount of processed foods that we take in. Um, and so that RDA is probably plenty for athletes. We do have some higher salty or sweaters. And so that's something that if you are, it's definitely worth taking into account the amount or trying to figure out the amount of salt you actually lose in your sweat, pay attention on hot days where maybe you're long, running longer or your intensity is higher because you're going to be potentially losing more salt. And that might be a place where you need to replace it. Um, and doing it through your daily diet is a, is a great way to do that. But it's, it's one of those things I get worried when I see 
super high sodium content in in some some products that people are drinking like you asked on a daily basis not necessarily in and around sport um because i think it's easy to lose track of the amount of salt we have in our food and then if we're adding extra sodium on top of that um we could be getting into a danger dangerous area okay so moving more towards performance nutrition now there's a new phenomenon, it feels like to me, where at least a lot of the top athletes who I'm in communication with are thinking now in terms of grams of carbohydrate rather than in calories. When I was coming up in the sport, it was sort of like aim for 250 or 300 calories an hour. And now I hear a lot of the top men and women talking about, you know, aiming for 70 to 100 grams of carbohydrates. So instead of calories, carbohydrates. Again, so um, yeah, tell me about that. Is that a new phenomenon? Am I interpreting that right? And what's the difference? How should people think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say it's a new phenomenon, maybe for athletes to talk about it, but um, not new in terms of the scientific research, right? Um, a calorie is simply a, a measure of energy. So um, interestingly, I mean, I love in Europe how they actually call calories energy instead of calling calories calorie. Like if you look on the back of something, I think it just reframes our our whole like uh, the whole way that we view nutrition because we need energy, right, to be high performing athletes. Whereas often calories have a have a negative um, context to them, but um, calorie, a calorie is basically measured a calorie for a particular food. They take the food, put it in what's called a bomb calorimeter. And it's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilo of water, one degree. Okay. And that is a calorie. Um, that's the most basic definition. So the amount of calories in grams of different micronutrients differs. So a gram of carbohydrate has four calories. A gram of protein has four calories. A gram of fat has nine calories. And so by moving the, um, the unit from a caloric unit, which can be any of those macronutrients we just talked about, to a gram amount of a particular macronutrient, we're, we're really getting a little more granular on what we need to be taking in and how that fuel is affecting us. So um, grams of carbohydrates, grams of protein, grams of fat are always what you see referenced in the scientific literature. And I'm making the assumption that we're seeing the trickle down effect of more athletes and coaches familiarizing themselves with the science and therefore using that terminology. And I think, I think that's a great thing. So interesting. I had no idea that, you know, that the calories were, based on what it takes to heat water. <laughs> Learn something new every day, I guess, especially when you're talking to Shannon. So I'd love to hear you talk about how terrain influences fueling needs too. Obviously our audience is nearly hundred percent trail people, trail runners. There's a lot of different types of trails around the world, flatter, smoother ones versus super steep, hyper-technical. So how does that change how people should think about their in-training, in-race fueling? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, I think I was first, so in it just personally, like, not not science based at all, but personally, was first kind of came into contact with this question when I was like in my triathlon phase. And um, I had signed up for an Ironman that was super hilly. And a friend of mine was doing it with me, but had all, had previously done an Ironman that was completely flat. And we were talking about the the challenges of both. And I made the assumption that the course for the hilly um, triathlon was going to be more difficult. And he actually felt that the flat triathlon was difficult, but in a completely different way, right? In that um, the flatter the course, potentially the more consistent and higher speed you will be maintaining. So while hills might present different challenges, both especially if you're at altitude, but also if we're looking at um, how your muscles are working. So we're, we're, we're using maybe different musculature to go uphill. And then of course, as we all know, like downhill running can often be some of the most painful 
um, because we're looking at eccentric loading of muscles, um, something that we're not used to and we have to train specifically for. Um, so when it comes to nutrition, I first look at it at like what energy systems we're using, which are dictated by intensity. So you could have the same intensity levels on a flat course as you do on, on a mountain course, just depending on like your own personal exertion on one or the other. And in terms of that, fueling would be the same. It might differ a little bit um, because of how you're using your muscles or the impact of like maybe a technical descent and the ability to fuel while you're going downhill. Um, so there are more like granular details that come in one versus the other. Um, but on a broad sense, right, we want to look at um, the intensity we're running at and how that determines like what kind of fuel our body's using, and then the amount of fuel we need to take in. Fascinating. So something you just said made me want to ask then too, going back to the timing question, right? If we're marching uphill, naturally we're going to be using more energy versus if we're running down sort of a smoother descent, right? I've always felt like I do better if I'm fueling more on that, you know, on the descents, right? Because I'm using less energy. So is there anything that you want to say here, any research or any subjective um, anecdotal, you know, observations that you've made about in races based on terrain, like when it might be optimal to fuel? Um, I think if you have a good feeling for when those climbs are coming up, um, fueling ahead of the climb could be critical, especially if you might feel that um, a higher heart rate or uh, um, more escalated breathing is going to interfere with your ability to take in fuel, which I feel like is often the case. Um, so it's more of like the difficulty of swallowing or drinking or getting in consistent fueling while you're on that gnarly uphill, right? Um, personally, I get worried about fueling on the downhill too, especially if it's a super technical fast downhill that I'm going to like superman it, eat shit. Um, so getting an idea of when those parts of a course are coming up and maybe making sure that you're, if, if you do feel like you have trouble fueling on the uphill or downhill, that you're getting in enough calories to support you through that phase of the race is going to be critical. So drink your bottle of orange drink when you're near the bottom of that descent, get ready for that next big climb. Okay. Understood. Totally, totally. <laughs> So another thing that I wanted to ask you about is, especially in these long races, to what extent it makes sense to introduce protein into the fueling strategy. For example, like at Hard Rock, when you're 15 hours in, you've been eating a lot of carbohydrates, maybe you're getting some palate fatigue or whatever. To me, it would sound delicious to have like a gnarly whey chocolate shake. Is that is that helpful or should people rely mostly on carbohydrates? Like is protein helpful at all, especially like use a long, maybe hundred mile race as an example? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I'm gonna give kind of my theory on endurance uh events. So um we cannot take in even though we're seeing kind of athletes really pushing the boundaries of the amount of fuel that they're able to consume. And that is through a lot of gut training and a lot of practice. Like if there's anything when I'm talking to endurance athletes, like you need to practice what you're going to do on race day. You need to slowly work up the amount of calories that you can take in with the foods that you're going to use. Like you have to get that nailed down. Um, and we are seeing athletes being able to take in more and more carbs, but just even with that, even with pushing those boundaries of the amount of calories you can take in, you're never going to be able to take in the amount of calories that you're actually burning. So you're creating a caloric deficit hour after hour after hour. And shit happens during ultra races, right? Like you for some reason get sick to your stomach and you're not really sure and you're not able to eat for an hour or all of a sudden you're have it coming out one end and you know that you're low on calories like on top of that caloric deficit that just naturally occurs we also have added challenges that like add to that so your body what your body is seeing is that caloric deficit and as we talked about earlier 
when you're in a caloric deficit, your body looks for other tissues that it can break down to make up for those calories. And often those tissue, that tissue can be uh, muscle and, and that's only going to make recovery harder um, for us in the end. And so introducing some protein or some amino acids during uh, an ultra event can actually, it would, I, I wouldn't think it would ever prevent, but it can maybe offset the amount of um, muscular breakdown that may occur and therefore help with recovery after. Um, the general recommendation for protein, if you're going to consume protein during a race, is around five to 10 grams. So it wouldn't be per hour. So it wouldn't be an entire, you know, gnarly way. Um, which has 25 grams of protein per serving. Protein takes a little bit longer for our bodies to digest. So consuming that much um, may shut your stomach down all at once and also may impact your, your body's processing of other nutrients you need like carbohydrates. So you could be doing yourself a disservice unless you practiced it and know you can handle it. Um, or at low enough of a heart rate that it, it shouldn't make too much of a difference. But um, I would recommend smaller amounts of protein or amino acids. So there are a number of products that include branch chain amino acids for that exact reason. It's why we have HMB in Gnarly Fuel 2O. HMB um, is a derivative of the branch chain amino acid leucine. And um, research has shown that while leucine is really good for turning on muscle protein synthesis, HMB is not that great for muscle, turning on muscle protein synthesis, but what it's really good at is preventing muscle protein breakdown. And that's why um, mm. that whole, like why I gave that whole description of like the caloric deficit we're creating during endurance events. That's why we have HMB and fuel 2 well. Um, but you could also, if it, you know, if you didn't want to take an amino acid containing um, supplement or you were, you were running purely consuming whole foods, finding some protein that your body could handle, but um, taking smaller amounts more consistently um, would be what I would recommend. Okay, great answer. You just mentioned a stomach shutting down. Everybody who's listening to this podcast can identify a moment in their trail running career where their stomach has shut down. Do you have any tips and tricks for how to recover and reset from those moments? Because it often is psychologically defa deflating at the same time that it causes an energy implosion. Yeah. I mean, I think it could differ for a lot of people depending on why your stomach shut down. So I, uh, I did this, I mean, it was when it was the scout mountain 50 K. I think it has a different name now. It's this great race in Idaho. That's beautiful. And I was doing great and came into this aid station and thought it was a great idea to grab like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that had like the peanut butter really lathered on. And I was hungry and, but ready to keep going. And I, threw down that entire peanut butter and jelly sandwich and it sh I, it shut my stomach down. I could not eat anything for the next hour. And when I look at that personal experience, to me, I see too much fat all at once. So fat and protein and fiber are, are three things that take our body a longer time to process and is similar to what I just said with the protein, you know, taking a whey protein shake in the middle of your of your run. When you have something in your stomach, one, you get increased blood flow to that area to try to help um, digest that food. Two, because of the length of time that it takes to digest either fat or protein or fiber, it's also going to impact your body's ability to, to break down the carbs that um, it needs to fuel your run. Um, and so taking in more food isn't necessarily going to help you out of that spot. But if you can try, I mean, my recommendation would be to try a liquid nutrition, something like um, Fuel 2O, where you are hydrating and getting in small amounts of calories to help both push the food through your digestive tract. That's what I'm thinking of when I'm talking about hydration, but also getting in some easy to digest carbohydrates that might boost your blood glucose. Um, I, I feel like that's probably a good way to get yourself out of that bad spot. Okay. Protein intake for athletes. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently, I've significantly increased my protein recently, and I've noticed a big benefit to my training and my recovery, especially. And it made me want to ask you, you know, oftentimes there's this conversation of as we get older as athletes, it just takes longer to recover. 
So like to what degree is that increased recovery length associated with maybe a deficiency in protein or anything you want to add in general about increasing protein intake as we age as athletes? Sure. Uh, first, I want to talk about protein intake, just like in general. Um, I feel like I mentioned this earlier, but oftentimes because endurance athletes, rightly so, are pretty focused on carb intake, to intake um, sometimes protein gets kind of pushed to the side as far as um, really being mindful of the amount we take in. Um, whether you're a strength athlete or an endurance athlete, if you're someone I'm talking to, I generally recommend starting at um, 1.5 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilo of body mass. So take the amount you weigh in pounds, divide it by 2.2, and then multiply it by 1.5 to 1.6. And that's going to be like your goal for daily protein intake. And I, I feel like that's a really good starting place. Um, traditionally, amounts for endurance athletes have been uh, have been lower than that along the 1.2 range. But there have been a few meta-analyses that have looked at athletes of all types and kind of settled on this 1.6 um, grams of protein recommendation um, as something that all athletes will benefit from uh, as far as promoting recovery. So as we age, sadly, um, the amount of protein we need goes up tremendously because our bodies don't respond to the amino acids in the same way that they did when we were younger. So we've talked about branch chain amino acids before. Leucine is kind of like the kingpin of the branch chain amino acids. It is the one that turns on the pathways responsible for muscle protein synthesis. So it's important to note um, that while the BCAAs or leucine in particular turn on the pathways, right? You need all the essential amino acids to actually to actually build muscle. Um, and so, as we age, we need even more leucine to turn on that same pathway. And that's why protein requirements go up substantially. So, um, into your 40s, you should be looking at getting closer to. 1.8 to 2 to maybe even 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. That 2.2 number is a gram of protein per pound. Um, so it's incredibly important that we get and maintain muscle on our frames because muscle provides um, basically feedback to our bones um, and keeps them nice and strong and healthy. And so as we age, if our protein intake goes down, generally caloric intake goes down, we start losing muscular mass, which affects how we move, which can then impact muscular mass even more. Um, we get, you know, higher at higher risk for things like osteoporosis. As your movement decreases, coordination decreases, you're more prone to falls. And then we have, you know, a recipe for broken bones, which can can be a, a major risk factor um, as we age just for quality of life. So incredibly important. You add on top of that the impact of changing hormone levels on risk factor for osteoporosis, especially in females approaching, you know, menopause and and the importance of getting in enough protein, maybe adding in creatine, 100% resistance training, in addition to doing, um, you know, any running you may do, it becomes paramount. Those are the things that no matter what kind of athlete I'm talking to, I'm stressing. Yeah. And it takes focused consideration consistently. Like for me, if I'm aiming based on these recommendations for 150 to 200 grams of carbohydrate a day, like it's not easy necessarily it's to hard. take yeah. in that much anyway. Yeah, time. it's hard. I mean, in general, like I, I'm not, I don't think there's anything wrong with counting your macros if that's something you like to do. I personally don't count my macros. Um, I'm in, mindful of what I'm eating and I have a pretty good idea of like, yeah, there's about this much protein in this. Um, what I try to make sure I do is get protein consistently throughout my day. So whether it's a, a full on meal or a snack, like I'm thinking about how I can add protein to what I'm eating. And, um, you know, 
also mindful of those higher protein meals. There was actually a study that just came out. So for a long time, um, you know, people were talking about even distribution of protein throughout the day being better than having like larger amounts in a skewed distribution. So a really high protein breakfast and a really high protein dinner, but not much protein in the middle of the day. Um, and there are some caveats to to the research that just came out. But I think the take home point is that um, we do process amino acids for longer than we thought. So you shouldn't necessarily shy away from having higher protein meals on the order of 40 to 50 grams. That research shows that we continue to benefit from the amino acids in that meal for up to 24 hours. But in order, like you said, to really try to hit those numbers, which can be hard for a lot of people, trying to get it consistently in all meals and all snacks is the only way to do that. So good. Last time you were on the podcast, you said something that we didn't go into detail on in that conversation. So I want to bring it up again here. And that is that soy protein in particular has gotten a bad rap. So why has soy's reputation been damaged and why is that unfair? Because there's a lot of yeah. plant-based athletes in the trail running community. I'm sure there's a lot of plant-based athletes yeah. in our audience. So, you know, do some myth, myth busting on soy protein for us. Sure. I'm a big fan of soy protein. Um, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I eat a lot of tofu. I eat a lot of uh, soy based foods. Um, so I, I feel like to answer this question, we have to first talk about protein quality. So people understand the difference between animal proteins and plant based proteins. Um, you can be a, a great athlete on either. You just have to um, maybe pay attention to a few more factors if you're solely consuming plant based protein. And that's because um, you know proteins are made up of amino acids and different types of proteins have both different um, combinations of amino acids and then also different quantities of those amino acids. So as athletes, you know, actually as humans, we're looking for proteins that are high in essential amino acids because our body, it's essential. We get essential amino acids from our food because our body can't synthesize them. Um, a subclass of those essential amino acids that are particularly important for athletes are branch chain amino acids. We already talked about those. Those turn on the light switch for muscle protein synthesis. Um, and plant-based proteins tend to be slightly lower in essential amino acids and, and definitely lower in branch chain amino acids, particularly leucine. It's also a misconception that plant-based proteins are not complete proteins. So you'll hear that everywhere. You'll see companies saying like, it's not a complete protein. A complete protein basically means it contains all the essential amino acids. And plant-based proteins definitely contain all the essential amino acids. It's just they might have lower levels of certain amino acids. And you can combat that by maybe choosing proteins that have complementary amino acid profiles. So a classic example is grains and beans beyond rice and beans being completely delicious together. They also complement the amino acid profile of one another. Another thing you can do is simply eat slightly more protein to make up for those lower levels. So that's like a good you know, general understanding of plant versus animal. So now we get back to soy, right? Soy has one of the best amino acid profiles of any, actually probably the best of any plant-based protein. The, another good one is uh, is pea protein, but soy is really high in, a, in most of the essential amino acids. It has one of the highest leucine contents. So it's a great one for plant-based athletes to incorporate. Where it got a bad name is soy has isoflavones in it that are estrogen mimickers, which means that um, there are certain estrogen receptors that they can bind to. Um, so there's, I may get this wrong. So if you're listening to this and you're like, Shannon's full of crap, <laughs> I'm, I'm putting an asterisk on this piece of it because I may have forgotten the right uh, estrogen receptors, but there's like a alpha estrogen receptor and a beta estrogen receptor. And um, whereas 
our hormone estrogen binds to the alpha estrogen receptor. Um, soy isoflavones actually bind to the beta estrogen receptor. So they don't actually compete, nor do they stimulate pathways that you would expect to be stimulated by um, the estrogen that we produce, you know, as humans. So for a while, people were like, yeah, if you eat too much soy, like men are going to develop female characteristics. 100 true um, that eating too much soy could have an impact, you know, in terms of uh, cancer risk for, for females. Not true, at least at the levels of soy that humans consume, even in cultures where soy is part of their everyday diets. Absolutely not true. Research has shown that time and time again. So I may have gotten those receptors wrong, but the gist of it is correct. And the research shows that you definitely do not have to worry about soy isoflavones having any kind of negative impact. They've even looked at whether or not soy could help women going through menopause because of the content of isoflavones. And the research on that isn't even solid. So that should tell you if soy actually contains something that, that had an impact on estrogen-mediated pathways. You wouldn't expect it to help women whose estrogen levels have dropped significantly because they're in menopause. That is not the case. So um, it is not a risk for any of those things. It's a great protein for plant-based athletes and folks that just like soy-based products to consume. I'm a fan. I'm so glad I asked. And your point about rice and beans is just so true. It makes you feel like there's some intelligence on planet earth, right? Like that those two things are so complimentary, even to the point that not only they are they delicious together, but they have complementary amino acid profiles. So they're almost meant to be uh, combined in burritos or any other type of uh, nutritional packaging. So <laughs> it's a match made in heaven. I yes. mean, it's, they're just good. A, another sort of pet topic that is on my mind a lot is that of alcohol. We are just emerging from dry January for me and for a lot of other people. Not going to lie. I had a couple beers last night. But, you know, I think about this a lot now, especially as I get busier and older. It just has a bigger impact on my performance as an athlete and my performance as a father and as a business person. So give the people the one-on-one on alcohol. What are the considerations? How is it metabolized? What are the consequences for the body? Yeah, so um, it's been great to see this as more of a part of kind of conversation that athletes are having. And I think um, coming across individuals that have chosen to be sober is more um, common than it ever has been before. And I love seeing that um, as part of the discourse. Similar to you, I do drink alcohol, but in the last couple of years, I've really um, tried to take a step back and look at when and why I drink because um, I think it's really, well, alcohol can be a great thing in terms of uh, a celebration. Um, you know, for a milestone in your life or a goal you achieved. Um, And there's also a cultural component to alcohol consumption. So you can go and explore a different culture and a particular type of alcohol or what it's combined with could be part of that culture. And that's also an amazing thing to experience. And I always like to bring that up. Where I think it can be dangerous is particularly for me when I can connect alcohol consumption to stress in my life. So you know, I've had a really day, a hard day. So, you know, I need this glass of wine or I need this beer um, because that can be a slippery slope because there are so many hard moments in life and you need to get into a a healthy way to deal with that stress and not necessarily, um, you know, rely on a drink to get you through it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because then that's just could snowball, but alcohol in general Um, You know, different people have different tolerances. The majority of alcohol is actually metabolized by the liver. Interestingly, about I think it's about 10 percent is lost in uh, water that we um, excrete. So it could be lost in breath and sweat in urine. Um, But alcohol consumption in general definitely can have an impact on um, athletic performance Um, adaptations to your training as well as recovery. So alcohol consumption has been linked to um, impaired muscle growth. 
Um, it's been linked to increased inflammation, definitely dehydration. We've all felt that um, at different parts of our life. Um, it disrupts sleep, which clearly has a number of uh, impacts in terms of recovery. And then it also impacts reaction time, um, which can can then impact you know the quality of our training. So I think a good start you know, is for people to be aware of all of those impacts that it can have. And then, you know, pay attention to where, when you integrate alcohol in your training, um, how it shows up for you. Um, for me particular, you know, I started wearing a whoop like last year. Um, I have always had sleep problems and um, it's something that I actively try to work on and drinking a glass of wine, even if it's just a glass of wine at night does me zero favors for my sleep quality. So the whoop helped me really like drive home that connection between the two and has, you know, then now changed my behavior. You know, getting better sleep is a hundred percent more important to me than having a glass of two of wine, a glass or two of wine while I'm, you know, cooking or at night. Um, I'd rather relax with a glass of tea and make sure I'm going to sleep well and recover well. So good. Yeah. Those whoops and aura rings, I think, took the subjective feeling of I'm not feeling 100% added some objective measurable things to it and have changed a lot of people's behavior. Shannon, we're already coming up to an hour. We'll save a lot of our other topics for our next conversation. I want to, before we wind down, touch on some gnarly specific things because I love you guys. And I think our listening audience would love to know a little bit more about some of the values and philosophies that you guys live and breathe. And I know sustainable packaging is really important to you and something that you guys recorded a podcast about recently. So talk about gnarly stance on sustainable packaging and why it's important. Yeah, sure. I mean, in I think when you think of protein, often you think of either these huge plastic tubs that protein powders come in or plastic bags. You know, we get that feeling when we're walking down the grocery store aisle in the supplement section, um, or you think of like a GNC. Um, and plastic recycling domestically in the US is absurd. Less than 5% of all products virgin plastic manufactured is actually recycled. Um, so that has nothing to do with whether or not you as an individual are putting your plastic into the recycling bin. It's 100%, even if you have the best in intentions and are putting it into your recycle bin, it's just simply not getting recycled. There are a number of reasons for that. That could be a whole podcast in itself. Turn, tune into the Narstool podcast. Yes. And, and you might hear me talk about that a little bit. Um, but it's just simply not happening. And even when it is recycled, it only has a lifetime um, of one to two uh, like recycling cycles um, yeah. before it starts to break down into microplastics, which we're now hearing are, you know, is we are found in breast milk, are found in all types of food. So microplastics are a major issue currently, and we don't know the full impact that they have, but they're definitely in places where they shouldn't be. Um, so plastic in general is a major problem. And we really became cognizant of the fact that all of our products were in plastic that we thought was recyclable, but in reality was not. Um, so another thing to, to pay attention to is that colored plastics are hardly ever recycled because they want white and clear plastics to then be able to color them in subsequent products. So mm. those are the worst offenders. Um, so we were looking for something that we could do that was a step forward that was internally driven. But I also had customers emailing me on a weekly basis, like, Think having really creative thoughts for how they could reuse their plastic tubs. Could we refill them? Um, and, you know, on a uh, manufacturing scale, like I simply can't do that. Like take a tub from someone, refill it also for many safety reasons. But I loved kind of the spirit with which we were getting these emails and we wanted to find a solution. So we moved all of our products that were in plastic tubs to stainless steel uh, cans. 
stainless steel is recycled at a rate, it's somewhere between 70 to 80% in the US. Um, one, you can put it in most curbside recycling bins. Two, because it's magnetic, um, landfills actually use magnets to pull steel out of, out of trash. So that increases the recycling rate. And then three, there is no lifetime limit. So it's infinitely recyclable. And mm -hmm. in most steel manufacturing, they use recycled steel to make new steel. So inherently, there's a, a complete circle in terms of using recycled products to make new ones. Um, so for all these reasons, we switched to steel cans. We also made sure that all the pouches that we use for our products that's still in bags are actually drop off recycle ready. So um, if you have your favorite product and it doesn't have a recyclable symbol on the back, it probably isn't. So most pouches are actually bi-layered. Um, so plastic on the outside and then the film on the inside. If they have multi-layers, they're, they can't be recycled. So look for products that actually have the drop-off recycling symbol. We're, we're taking some more actions this year to try to even further reduce the, pl the plastic in our line um, that we're looking to launch in the spring. But it's definitely one of those things that there's never going to be the perfect solution, but we're trying to make steps in the right direction. Um, and we're pretty proud of that because you, you really don't see too many people in the in the food and supplement space um, really attacking this issue more than just kind of surface level talk. Yeah. Something I really admire about you guys between the sustainable packaging and also like the NSF certification, which we talked about last time you were on the podcast, you really do walk the walk. And I'm assuming that comes with financial sacrifices. So without divulging any numbers, uh, if there's anything you want to say about, you know, the economic cost of staying true to your values as a brand, I'm sure the listeners would be interested. Yeah, I mean, I, I gnarly products aren't the cheapest products. Um, and part of that is because we've invested in things like qual third party quality testing and um, packaging that's more sustainable. We do try to take on as much of that cost internally as we can without passing on the entirety of the cost to the consumer, but some of it does pass on. So both of that you know, both of those things affect, you know, the revenue that we bring in either because it eats into our margin or because our products are maybe higher priced than other competitors. Um, but I think one of the most important things we, we can all do as consumers is, is really spend our money um, in a way that aligns with our values. Um, if we're able, if we have the resources to be able to do that, of course, not everybody is, is that privileged and that's something to take into consideration. But if you do have those resources and are able to make sure the products that you're using align with like what you want to see in the world. So good. So as we wind down here, Shannon, I know we've got a very special new product coming down the pipeline. You and I have talked about this. We spent a, the bulk of our conversation talking about protein, and I'm sure our listeners would love to hear uh, what's coming down in terms of a, a new flavor, it seems like, that you're going to be introducing soon. Yeah, I'm pretty damn excited about this because I've been making it at my house for years. Um so it is the inspiration is the Ayurvedic recipe for golden milk. So we all are familiar with the many benefits of turmeric. It's a strong anti-inflammatory. Um, there's definitely some research showing that it can be beneficial for brain health. Um, and golden milk um, has a lot of turmeric in it, as well as cinnamon, ginger, black pepper extract. So we are releasing next week a um, gnarly vegan golden milk flavor, and it is out of this world. It is so delicious. Um, the thought was to release it as a you know limited time flavor like offering, but I don't know. I might be too addicted to it that we might have to bring it into the line full time. Like I'll have to send you some, Dylan. It is it is so good. It sounds delicious. It sounds delicious. And uh, so by the time this podcast comes out, it will be available based on the time frame that you just provided. So to our listeners, make sure you go check it out. The Golden Milk Protein from Gnarly Nutrition. And we are also, at least in the initial stages of talking about the evolution of the orange drink. So we'll save that. The drink. 
Yeah. So, so maybe when, when we have that more fleshed out, you can come back on and we can tick through some of the other topics that I had on our docket here today. Uh, because of course, when you come on the show, we, we power through as much as we can. And, uh, yeah, anyway, the listeners love you and we'll have a lot of opportunities to continue this conversation in the future. But Shannon, again, I, posed my traditional opening question to you at the beginning. So now I have to give you my traditional closing question. And that is just who is one person that you admire? This person can be inside or outside of sports, living or dead. And why do you admire that person? Yeah, I mean, I, so I recently saw the, the Nyad film, Diana Nyad film. And for many reasons that was inspiring and her story was inspiring to me. I knew who she was beforehand and I knew what she had accomplished. But um, I think getting to know her story a little bit more, learning about uh, the fact that, you know, possibly her greatest accomplishment, you know, swimming from Cuba to Florida, um, she did when she was in her 60s after multiple failed attempts and never gave up. I just find that so inspiring, um, both as a female athlete and as an aging female athlete. Um, I think the she she said that when she finally did it and she was standing on the beach, um, you know, she talks about never, ever giving up. And uh, she talks about not being too old. And that even in solitary sports, um, you, teamwork is still such an integral part of accomplishing our goals and dreams. And I feel like the free trail community is a great example of that um, because it really does like having that community and that team behind you is so motivating and inspirational. So, yeah, I'd say, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot, a lot about her and what she accomplished. So great. I knew her name. I knew she was a swimmer. I just pulled up her Wikipedia page here. It seems like she's written a couple books. So now I have some homework for when we sign off of this podcast. Diana and I had a great answer to our final question. Shannon, always great. You've to got to watch that real quick. You've got to watch the documentary on Netflix because it just came out. Um, Jimmy Chin and uh, Chai, I feel horrible. I can't remember her name. They just uh, produced that, wrote and produced, I believe, that documentary just won um, some awards. It's great. Uh, Jodie Foster and Annette Benning are in it. So huge recommendation there. Read the books as well. But, Incredible. Um, but it's a really great film. Okay, Netflix yeah. sorted out for this weekend also. <laughs> Shannon O'Grady, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's always great to connect with you. I'm sure the listeners will gain a lot from the conversation. Thanks, Dylan.